them and not sing them to look at the, the real meaning. And uh, we were singing, Who Am I? And not because of who I am, but because of what you've done. Not because of what I've done, but because of who you are. That's the, the God that we serve. doesn't matter what we've done in our lives. He went to the cross to die for each and every one of our sins. And he did it once and for all. He doesn't have to go back there day in and day out. And verse 3 of how great thou art is one of, Mike, thank you for that, because that's one of my favorites. That on the cross, my burden gladly bearing. He, he didn't do it with resentment in his heart, though. I, I'm just going to do this because God sent me. No, I'm going to do this because I love those that he sent me for. He bled and died to take away my sin. This morning, if you have your Bible, we're going to be in Hosea chapter 6. And if you've listened to me preach very many times, I, I was looking back at my notes. I don't think I've ever preached in Hosea, maybe one time in all the years that I've been preaching. We're going to be in chapter 6, uh, starting in verse 1. If you would stand whenever you find that. It's after Daniel, if that helps you. <laughs> Hosea 6, in verse 1. Come, let us return to the Lord, for he has torn us and he will heal us he has wounded us and he will bind up our wounds we will revive us after two days and on the third day he will rise us raise us up so we can live in his presence let us strive to know the lord his appearance is as sure as the dawn he will come to us like the rain like the spring showers that water the land let's pray this morning heavenly father god we just thank you for this day again that you've given us we thank you for this time of worship that we've had, God, that we can sing your praises of how great you truly are, God, because you were willing to go to the cross for our sins. And God, I'm so thankful you don't look at the things that we've done in our lives, but you look at the, the heart of a person, God. And God, I just ask that each and every one of us here this morning, if no, someone here doesn't know you, that today would be that day, God, that they would leave this place knowing they have a home with you in eternity, God. God, for those that are Maybe here this morning that are Christian that are, have been living their life, God, I ask that you would help each and every one of us to remind ourselves that there's still more living to be done. God, there's still more work for you that needs to be completed. God, we thank you for your willingness to die on a cross for us. And God, we just ask that you forgive us where we fail you. In Jesus' name, and amen. So this morning, I won't ask for a raise of hands, so don't raise your hand, okay, please. But I, the question I was thinking this week as I was preparing this message, and have we truly repented in life? Again, I'm not going to ask for a raise of hands for what we say we've repented in life. I don't, don't need all that. But I've heard the question asked in a different way, and sometimes it's this, how often shall I repent of my sins? Well, in short, the answer is always, right? And I could just say, well, you always repent and be done, Okay not always that simple right I can remember when I was 9 10 11 years old I hadn't been a Christian too many too long at that point I was saved when I was eight I can remember praying at bedtime God forgive me of the sins I don't even know I committed today why because I still didn't understand all those things right sometimes I think we could go our whole lives and not really understand what sin looks like some days right some days it's what we say and sometimes it's it's what we don't say whatever it might be so these verses, though, this, this morning point directly to salvation. They don't point just to a little bit of thing. They point directly to Jesus in these first three verses. They speak of Jesus. So the name of the author, Hosea, uh, his name simply means salvation. Uh, now I want you to think about that. He wrote, he's a minor prophet, what we would consider a minor prophet, right? Right? And he wrote this book 700 years before Jesus ever walked this earth. But yet his name, on purpose, okay, means salvation. It's not by accident that, Jesus, that God uses people that go with what he's talking about. Amen? If, if you look at the meaning of very many people in, in the Bible, there's a reason that God used them. But 700 years he wrote this before Jesus ever walked this earth. There's no way he got this word except from God above. Amen? 
when we think of the word being inspired by God, you don't have to look very far to see. If you seek Jesus in the Old Testament, I'm going to tell you the word was inspired by God, period. We can look at other things as well, but if you see Jesus in the Old Testament, they didn't know who Jesus was, right? And and I've said it before, I think of Abraham when he was told to go sacrifice Isaac. Can you imagine, uh, you you waited all these years to have a a child, and now God's saying, I need you to go sacrifice this child. That was a picture of what Jesus was going to do for us. Abraham represents the father, and we, God the father, right? He would give his own son because God asked him to, right? Abraham didn't go and say, well, I don't think I want to do that. He told Isaac, hey, we're going to go do a sacrifice today, right? Can you imagine Isaac when he asked the question, hey, where's this animal? What are we going to do? Oh, God will provide. Can you imagine being able to say that as a parent, though? When God's asked you to give your own child, I think each and every one of us have been asked to give in our lives to God. So what does true repentance look like? So to define it, it means to repent. Repent, right, to repent means to have a sincere regret or remorse. So to have a regret that I have done something, right? That word, I'm sorry, sometimes is hard, okay? But the prophet Ezekiel put it this way in in chapter 18, verse 30 of, of Ezekiel. Repent and turn yourselves from all your transgressions, so iniquity shall not be your ruin. So true repentance is not simply having remorse. It's not simply being sorry about something. But it's also to have a desire to change the way you do things and no longer live the way that you were living before. We can think of drastic examples and we can think of when Saul was converted on the Damascus Road, he repented and turned from his evil ways. Does that mean he didn't have an evil bone in his body? No, okay. He was still a sinner in need of a savior, right? When we look at the scripture this morning, it says, let us return to the Lord. And we think, well, I never left the Lord. The Lord never left me. But I think so often we as Christians have missed the mark. Amen? We're being honest. We've missed the mark. Have we truly repented and turned from the things that God's called us to? So when I was studying this week, one of my my Bibles said the Israelites were not showing genuine repentance. If you look at the history, they did not truly understand the depths of their sin. I think it's like a, a little kid, you tell them, hey, tell your, your sibling I'm sorry for hitting you. They don't. They're not, they don't mean it, right? They're just saying it so mom and dad will leave me alone, okay? A- Annabelle does that from time to time, and, and she doesn't say I'm sorry, but she just looks at you, and you're like, well, maybe she is sorry. I don't know yet. She's too little to tell me. She just looks at you, and you just feel bad for her, I guess. I don't know. But, but they, didn't, they didn't understand what their sin truly was doing to their lives. I think we as the church today have not realized that our sin has led us to where our country is today it's not just the leaders in our country that have put us where we are or or helped us to where we are however you want to look at that but it's also those of us that are christians today have not picked up our bible the sword so to speak right and gone and shared the gospel and said hey god is more important than your political views and your whatever right the country we, we live in was founded on the bible but somewhere along the way we've got away from it amen whether we want to admit it or not, it's the reality. Because we haven't repented and turned. So they did not turn from their idols, regret their sins, or plan, pledge to make a change. They just said, hey, we're going to do this, and then they just moved on with their life. I think of when Moses went up to get the Ten Commandments. What did they do? <laughs> they talked to Aaron into getting them a, a golden calf made, right? And they were going to idolize this calf. Though God had led them through the wilderness this far. Yet they were still going to be in the wilderness for how many years? 40 years because of their disobedience to God. So if there's something that's an idol in your life, you need to get rid of it. If there's something that you're saying, well, I don't got time for God because of this, you need to get rid of it. And I know that sounds easy, but it's it's not, okay? So the question, I and I put it in my notes, we have to ask each and every one of ourselves, because I can't answer it for you, what have we allowed to be an idol in our life? What, what have we allowed to be an idol in our life? I joke when I played bass for, for Jamie Johnson and, and East Salem when we would go to church camp and we would get a little off track sometimes for practice and we had a, a Matt Breeze is his name and Matt's a phenomenal guitar player. He would break out in some rock song, okay? And we were just jamming around. Well, then we're all distracted, okay? We're all doing these things that are not where we need to be. I think so often in life we get distracted. It's not really an idol, but we get distracted by it. 
and eventually it becomes an idol. We were talking uh, a couple weeks ago, Sheila had her, her boot on and, and she said she didn't have to wear it anymore. But she said, I feel like I'm still hobbling around, I'm limping. Why? You get accustomed to doing things, right? You start a habit, it's hard to break that habit. If you start hobbling around because you broke your foot or something, guess what? You're probably going to hobble around some more once you're recovered because you're used to hobbling around. If you're used to not opening your Bible, guess what? You're probably not going to open your Bible. It's the same concept in anything in life. I've heard before it takes 30 days to make a habit, but 90 to make a lifestyle. I don't know about you, I don't want a habit of reading my Bible. I want a lifestyle of being in the Word. I don't want, a, I don't want a, a, a habit of praying because guess what? Habits are just habits, right? I do it because I feel like I have to. But when it's your lifestyle, it's something you've chose to do, amen? You've chose to follow Jesus. So Israel was interested in God, listen to me, only for the material benefits he provided them. Christian, where's the church at today? We're only satisfied when God's providing for us sometimes, Amen? I was talking, we were talking about Rick Hayes and his son's been in the hospital. He, he was preaching, this, he preached this morning. He's preaching right now probably. And he, his sermon was titled, You've Got to Shout or something like that. How, how do you shout during adversity? Because of the, what Jesus did for us. Not, not because of what I did, but because Jesus did it. They did not value the eternal benefits that came from worshiping God. I think so often the Israelites were talked about the way they were because it was God knew it was going to be us right sometimes we as Christians are only satisfied when things are going our way we're, we're only satisfied when things on this earth are, are being done the Bible says don't tra- set your treasures here on earth amen it says to set them above if you're only worried about today guess what you're setting your treasures for tomorrow you're not setting them for eternity tomorrow it says in the song I'm just a vapor in the breeze, right, in the wind, right? I, I, I'm not here for very long. As I studied this week, another Bible study, the author, he said this, what do you hope to gain from your religion? Do you, quote, unquote, repent easily without seriously considering what changes need to take place in your life? without seriously considering what changes need to take place in your life. I can go to God and say, God, I, I, I'm sorry for the sin that I've done, but guess what if I do it again tomorrow? I've not really turned from my sin. Amen? I've just told God, God, I'm going to give it to you, but I'm going to take it right back. I was reading a book this week, and the author, uh, he served in the military, and uh, he's been in ministry for several years, but he wrote a book called Through the Gate. And he went to preach at a conference one time, and he was telling this story. I was at a Johnny Hunt conference in, in February, and he was telling us this story. And he said there was these eight little boys that were standing at the gate. And he said, hey, can we let them in? And, he, and they said, you don't want those kids in your service. These kids were known for not being the good kids, right? They were on the other side of the fence. He was under conviction during the time he was preaching. I tell a story for a reason. And when he got back out of the, the, the service he went to that gate, and there was five boys there. And he shared the gospel with five boys, and five of them became a Christian that night. But he said he wrote this book because he said, I missed out on three because I was worried about it, what it would look like. How often do we forget to share the gospel because that person doesn't look like us? The, the people that he was with, the, the host and everything, said that they were those, that group of people were known for stealing. They were known for taking advantage of people. But yet, if they'd just let them in the gate, how much different things would have been, right? We as Christians have forgotten that the gate, they can see us, amen? It's not a privacy fence. Being a Christian is like a chain link fence. They can see you. They see what you do. They see what you say. They see how you act. So when you read Hosea chapter 6 and verses 1 through 3, guess what? It says a call to repentance is how it is labeled in my Bible. Why? Christian, this morning, we need to be on our knees repenting because we haven't followed what Jesus has called us to. If you come back tonight, I'll be talking about our calling in life, but I think so often we as Christians, if I can tell you my opinion, we've, we've repented, but we haven't thought very seriously about change in our life. God, I know I haven't read my Bible very well, and I'm going to do better. Well, better never comes, because we've forgotten that when I tell God I'm going to do something, I better be doing it. Amen? If I tell God, hey, God, I'm going I'm to give you this, <laughs> then I better give it to him. That same book I was reading, he was talking about 
Daniel and Daniel tell, or David, I'm sorry, David tells him to search me, Lord. God can see everything about us, but yet David still told him to search me. Why? Because David was ready to give everything back to God. This was after his sin with Bathsheba, after all the heartache he'd been through. He was ready to say, hey, God, have control of my life. When was the last time we told God to have control of our lives? So the first thing I really want us to look at is we need to return to God. Come, let us return to the Lord. And it says, for he has torn us and he will heal us. He has wounded us, but he will bind up our wounds. I want you to think just a minute about that. If he's wounded me, I probably don't want to go back to him, right? But I'm going to tell you, the wound that they're talking about is the one that you get when you come to church. You get put under conviction. That wound is from God because it is the one that is the thorn in your side that makes you wake up and go, hey God, I'm not doing what I need to be doing. I'm not living the life that I need to live day in and day out for Jesus. I think I said it last week, I may, I, maybe I put it in my notes for something else. I'm not satisfied with where I'm at in serving Jesus. That doesn't mean I want to leave Ellis Pound. Okay? It doesn't mean I don't want a pastor. It means that I'm not satisfied where I'm at in my walk. I need to be better. And I know each and every one of us have that moment in life that we probably need to be better. Amen? Whether we realize it or not, we need to return to God, not just as a church, as individuals, but as a country altogether. You know what's something we don't do anymore? Revival. Right? We have a week of revival a year we say we're good. I can remember the, hearing the stories my grandma tells of revival when she was a kid. You would go two and three and four weeks to Revival. And the country was a different place, right? The church was a different place because the conviction was there. Church, I hate to say it, but we're not very convicted some days. Amen? Whether we like that or not, I, I, I can tell you right now, we're not convicted very well to share the gospel or the gospel would be spreading. And that's not just a punch at everybody here. That's every Christian, okay? We all need to be working to see Jesus move in our, in our lives and in the lives of others. So for us to return to God, we have to, we have to do something first. We've got to get over ourselves. <laughs> I can't do it on my own, right? I, I, can't, I can't do it on my own because I'm a person, right? You know why God calls you to an area that you're not comfortable with? <laughs> so you can be dependent on him. I think God doesn't call us to our comfort zone because he knows that we're just going to do it on our own. We've talked about comfort zone a lot. I don't know why it keeps coming up. It's not in my notes, I promise. You can look later. But we get so caught up in what's in it for me. I'm afraid so often we do that. What's in it for me when I come to church? What's in it for me when I read the Bible? Those of you that have been a Christian a long time, you know what I'm talking about. You know what joy you get when you truly read the word of God. And don't just open the, well, I'm going to open the book tonight and I'm going to read this one chapter because I feel like I have to read that chapter. No, I want to be able to open the book and say, he will revive us after two days and on the third days he will raise us up so we can live in his presence forever. I, I don't want to just look at the word. I want to be in the word so that the word speaks to me. Amen? There's something about returning to God that when you return to his book, you see the things. I, I think of the song excuse me, that Crowder sings, and it's called Red Letters. Basically said, I, I was a sinner in need of a Savior. And he said, but it, when I read the red letters, when I saw the red on the page, and I, I've had people tell me, well, you know, the new Bibles don't have red letter. And I, I, some people are like, well, you don't need that. No, you don't need the letters to be read to know what Jesus is talking. But man, when you see that red on your Bible, I, I, I'll be honest, when I was a kid and an early Christian, when I read the red that was on the Bible, it stopped me, and it made me pay attention. Even more so, right, than God's word. But when Jesus spoke, I think of how God spoke the world into existence. That's what I think of when I see the red letters on the page. That whatever Jesus speaks into, he brings life to. So the second thing I want us to look at, we have to look at the life Jesus had after death and believe that God will do that in our lives as well. It says in verse 2, or revive us after two days. But on the third day, on the third day, he will raise us up. I, that, that's Jesus right there. Amen. On the third day, he's going to rise us up. He's going to raise us from the dead on the third day. 
Jesus did not only died on a cross, he not only was buried in a tomb, but that tomb could not hold him inside. We as Christians should not just look lightly and say, well, he died for me and he lived again. No, he died in a grave, but he rose from the dead to live again. That's how our sin was carried away. So if you think that the salvation happens without the empty grave, you're fooling yourself. We're fooling the world by saying, well, I'm not really sure if that happened. No, I know without a doubt that stone was rolled away so I could see in. Amen? That stone wasn't rolled away for Jesus to get out. So we have to look at Jesus' life. We have to look at his death. We have to look at his life after death. I'm not talking life of eternity. He showed up in real life to people after his death. It wasn't so it really happened, okay? But it was so they had a faith in Jesus Christ. I, th- I think so often of, of Peter, and I, I've said it before, Peter had a big mouth. I can relate, okay? I mean, Peter could have been friends probably. We don't speak, speak before we think sometimes, right? But I think of what he did before Jesus' death, and I can imagine the shame that he felt because I rejected the one who loved me. Yet what did Jesus tell him three times? <laughs> Look after my sheep, right? L- Look after my sheep. He told him that three times. Why? Because he still believed in Peter. I've s- preached it before on, are you a, a Peter or a Judas? I'm gonna tell you right now, I'd rather be a Peter. Why? They both, made, they both sinned and fell short of the glory of God. But Peter was willing to go, God, I... I still need you. I, I, I need to find my, Peter found his knees, right? And he repented and he turned from his evil ways. There's no other sign of Peter being disobedient to God outside of when the rooster crowed on the third time he did it. There's, there's no other sign of it in, in the rest of the Bible that Peter was not obedient to God. Why? Because he truly repented of what God had shown him. Judas had sinned and fell short as well. But the Bible says Judas went to a place of his own. Judas didn't make that decision to repent and come back to Jesus. He he didn't make that decision that, hey, I messed up, I'm going to go back. But the last part of verse 2 in our scripture this morning, so we can live in his presence. So he will revive us after two days, and the third day he will raise us up so that we can live with him. If Jesus wasn't raised in the grave, we have no chance of eternity. If Jesus simply had died on a cross and not been raised on the third day, we cannot live in his presence. But because we serve a risen Savior, and I know it's not Easter, but we should celebrate Easter every day. Why? Because Jesus is still risen. Whether it's Easter or Christmas, it's still risen. Whether it's January through December, it doesn't matter. He's still risen and on the, on the throne today. And the third thing I really want us to look at, and I'm going I'm to try to wrap this up. We must strive to know God. Verse 3 says, let us strive to know the Lord. His appearance is as sure as the dawn. He will come to us like the rain, like the spring showers that water the land. Let us strive to know the Lord. When you really look at the word know, it means you have an intimate relationship, right? If you really look at the relationship that we're to have with, with God, it's an intimate relationship. So we have to strive to know him more today than we did yesterday. I will never claim to be a Bible scholar, okay? I like to study the Bible. I like to read uh, other books that that are related to the Bible, but I will not ever consider myself a scholar. But I know that I know Jesus more today than I did yesterday. I I know that I've developed and I know more about him today, right? My relationship with him is only getting better and not worse. Christian, we should strive to get to know God better every day because his appearance is as sure as the dawn. As sure as the sun's gonna rise, God's going to be here. As sure as, as sure as the day is over, when the, when the sun is setting, God is still there. That is the God that we serve. And I'm so thankful that in eternity, eternity we don't have to say when the sun rises. Because <laughs> the light is Jesus. And he's going to be up every day. All day. So if we strive to know God, true repentance should be what we strive for. We serve a a God who, in Jesus, who walked this earth. He was tempted in every way we're tempted. Every way that we're tempted. I, I I don't care which way you want to throw that. Every way that we're tempted, 
Jesus was tempted. And yet he remained without fault. Even in his death, he remained without fault by dying before they came and broke his legs. I've said it before and I'll say it again. If you don't think the Old Testament and the New Testament go together, you need to read it again. The scripture says that he would be give his life, right, in the Old Testament, and not a bone would be broken in his body. We have to strive to know God each and every day. He's coming back. And I think when Hosea wrote this, let us strive to know his appearance is as sure as the dawn. He wasn't thinking. He was thinking about his true appearance that was coming. Jesus came and walked this earth, and that was the first appearance of God. But I'm going to tell you, he's coming back. And we as Christians, we better get ready. We better start sharing the gospel. We better make sure that our heart is where it needs to be with God. It's like when you lose a loved one, you want to make sure you tell them everything you can before you lose them. I want to tell you, I want, I want to be prepared for eternity because I don't know when it could happen. She mentioned in Sunday school, a friend of hers lost her husband last week in a, in a motorcycle accident. Life changes like that. And I think we as Christians have forgotten that until something happens. And I, I'm not picking on Sheila, but I bet Sheila was going, oh my gosh, I never, never dream of something happening like that. Never dream of a car accident. Never dream of, uh, of uh, we had another little boy we were talking about. He, his grandfather accidentally ran him over with a lawnmower. We don't know what can happen in life. But that's why we have to serve God today as if he's coming back. I'm asking Sheila and Carrie to come. I'm asking that you stand this morning. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to wrap it up, I promise. I'm going to close out of my notes so I don't say any more. <laughs> I don't know about you, but I know some days I need to return to God. I know there's some days that I needed to get a little stronger in my faith to God. Each and every one of us is a vessel made by God to be used by God. Are we allowing God to use us? Heavenly Father, as we come to you today, God, God, I thank you for those that are here. God, I thank you that we can be in your word this morning. And God, I thank you that we can look to you and repent of our sins, God, and that you will throw them as, east, as far as the east is away from the west. God, we cannot thank you enough that you're our advocate, God, that you hear our prayers, that you hear our problems, God, that when we fall short of your glory, we're still able to turn to you. God, I ask this morning that if there's one here that doesn't know you, that today would be that day, that they would... Just put it down all the walls and allow you to take full control, God. That they would allow you to be the Savior of their life. The Lord of Lords to them. God, for those that are saved this morning, you know every heart. God, I ask that you would put each and every one of us under conviction. God, that you would put each and every one of us in a place that we know we need to serve you better. God, there's, one, there's not one here this morning that can say, I'm serving God in all capacity. God, I pray that you would convict us of that, that you would help each and every one of us to look to you. And God, I just ask that your will would be done above all else, though. And God, again, I just thank you for those that are gathered. Forgive us where we fail you. In Jesus' name, amen.